Good morning and welcome to Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. I'm Nancy Allspot Jackson. And I'm Shannon Penrod. Hello, my friend. I'm thrilled to have my friend back. I know. I was on the East That's Coast nice. visiting family and in the Outer Banks of the Carolinas in the sunshine. And you look a little tan. A, a little bit tan, you yeah. You sun kiss. Yeah, That's yeah. Good. That was a good byproduct of it. It'll be gone in a couple of days. It's good probably. vitamin D. Good, yeah, get that serotonin up. <laughs> yes. So, uh, and, and you, do you feel rested? Because a lot of times after a vacation, you know, it's easy to feel exhausted. Afterwards. I feel a little tired because <laughs> um, flying back from the yeah. East Coast and a couple of connecting flights and stuff is. We weren't expecting her one. today. She he, she's here, and I was like, "What are you doing here?" I yeah. thought we were, I thought you weren't back till tomorrow. So it's an unexpected pleasure. Well, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad you're here too. And then in a little while, we're going to have Dr. Linda Copeland. Right. We call her the unicorn for those of you who are new to the show because she is a developmental pediatrician and a BCBA, a board mm -hmm. certified behavior analyst. And we don't know of anybody else who is both of those things, okay. which is kind of a luscious combination. Yeah, it is. She knows, has a lot of experience. Right. And and whenever you you want to go and talk to a pediatrician about something, you, you would love if they understood ABA and what you're trying to do. And, right. Um, and she's that And person. we're talking to her about sleep, is my understanding. Sleep. She's going to talk with us Which about is, sleep. Gonna, I'm going to have some questions on that. Why Absolutely. We were jet lagged. Wyatt hit the sack at 7 o'clock last night when oh. it was light outside. Right. Then he woke up at 12 wanting to play Wii and, right. you know, have right. a good time He's for hours. He's discombobulated, as He's we said. He's discombobulated. <laughs> how do I get him combobulated? Well, we'll talk to Dr. Dr. Copeland about how that works. Okay. And she's also got information about a study so that if you guys want to participate, there's the potential for that. And so that's going to be in just a few minutes. We hope that we're going to be able to uh, have more information from Alex Plank at the Autism Society. You just watched uh, an interview that we did with him yesterday at the Autistic Health Ex, uh, the it was a meeting of the minds. I don't think it was an expo, but it was a conference. It was a meeting of the minds. Uh, and today he's at the Autism Society of America National Conference, and we're hoping to drop in with him a little bit later. But first, we have some news. Yes, we do. Um, I like this article, Shannon, that you found. Um, it's out of the UK, but it's four autism stereotypes that teachers should try to dispel, written by a teacher. And um, they're... The, the premise is that you should quickly abandon any preconceived idea, ideas on what autistic people are like because they're as diverse as any group of young people. Absolutely. It's that but, thing that they, they credit Dr. Stephen Shore was saying, although he says, I don't, was I the first person that said it? Uh, but but we credit him with it saying when you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. And that's so obvious to me because I look at all the different... <laughs> right? Yeah. But do you remember sometimes what it was like before we had kids with autism, the things that we didn't know? Oh, yeah, for sure. I didn't, uh, what I knew about autism couldn't have felt, filled a thimble. Right. And the number one thing is people with autism are geniuses. And um, it's one of the longest running stereotypes because it was popularized by, of course, the movie Rain Man, where Dustin Hoffman had the ability to instantly count yes. the hundreds of objects. And I think a lot of us were swayed by that portrayal. It was one of the most yeah. popular portrayals, obviously, in mainstream television. Well, even... I mean, film. Yeah, but even beyond that, it seemed like for decades that whenever they covered autism stories in the news, it was always a savant. Yeah. There was that one young man who's still very prolific that he, you can fly him in a helicopter over a city and then sit him down in a room and, and he, he would can draw. draw the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, verbatim. Um, yeah, and it would just like, you just look at it and go, my goodness, this is amazing. It's a miracle. Um, and I think, I think it maybe it was the media's way of trying to put a spin on it that right. allowed people to see positives. Right. But unfortunately, when your kid is in a classroom and the teacher is expecting them to be a genius mm -hmm. and not everybody's a savant, no. um, it, it's not helpful. Right. Not helpful so to assume it, they, that. they conclude with the truth is that while many people who are geniuses have autism, the reverse does not hold true. Is a wide range of intellectual abilities. Absolutely. And then uh, the second one, people with autism have prodigious memories. Yeah. Not necessarily. Which and that this is right out of England. That. And that yes. they, they, they reference the television series, The A Word. Which, which received did, did a lot you get of to positive. see that? I never saw the A word. I we, understand it was quite good. I'll, I'll be honest with you. We watched like the first three or four episodes, and then I got uninterested because they were doing a kind of therapy that I just 
it wasn't ABA, and I, mm -hmm. and, I and I was frustrated with that. I was right. like, this kid needs ABA, um, and then I just, I, but it was good, good acting, good storytelling, and I would say the first three episodes, watching the family deal with the child getting diagnosed, right on the money, really? right on the money. Um, but in that case, the kid knew, the dad had listened to 80s music and the kid knew every single song, what the band was, what the backstory with the, ba with the band was, what year it was produced, you know, everything that would have been in the liner notes on the CD cassette uh, right. thing, that kid knew. And, and some kids do have a pocket of things that they have knowledge of and memory of, but it's not true of everyone. No, it's not. And we can't assume that. No. Um, and that's a good thing for teachers not to assume. I love number three. Number three is, you know, don't assume that people with autism have no sense of humor because a lot of times they, they are hilarious and their sense of humor is spot on. If you doubt that, please uh, go on Netflix or is it Amazon? But the, the film Asperger's or Us is available. It's for gentlemen with they Asperger's are very funny. and they are hilarious. Um, so great sense of humor. I was just thinking about, we saw them in performance and at the end of the performance, they had a talk back and people could ask questions right. and what, they were asking about jobs from the audience. You know, do you guys have jobs? And one of them was saying, well, I used to be a paper boy and he went on to say something and one of the other ones muttered, but now he's a real boy. <laughs> and I just fell apart because I thought it was hilarious. That's um, funny. You know, very unexpected yeah. uh, senses of humor, uh, and but hilarious. So don't assume that people with autism don't have a sense of humor. And then having autism means ticking every box, meaning check every single uh, right. symptom and quality. It's a long list of yeah. things that if you have a certain number of them qualify you for autism, but nobody has all of them. No. And by the way, nobody has none of them. Exactly. Even, you know, we have some of those things. Right. And all the time, I'm sure you've experienced this where parents are like, I don't know, but I think maybe I have it. And it's because, you know, we have several, everybody has several of them. Mm -hmm. But you have to have a certain number of them to qualify for a diagnosis, but no person has, has all, all of them. them. Exactly. So that was Amazing. interesting, and I thought a good article. I thought so, too. And then um, people with autism are better at avoiding sneaky marketing tricks. A yeah. secret superpower, according to a new article. You know, and isn't it refreshing? A lot of the times we focus on what our kids can't do. Deficits. And, right? And I, I love your friend, Howie Mandel, who said, instead of uh, focusing on disability, how about if we focus on this ability? You know, what can our kids do? And and this, this study kind of looks at something that our kids do differently and that there's a benefit from. That so often when marketing is decided in whatever towers on Madison Avenue right. that they decide, it's appealing to our baser brain, right? Okay. Um, that they try to sell us, uh, you know, an iPad and tell us it's going to solve all of our problems. Mm -hmm. It's going to make us wealthy, that it will attract whatever sex we mm -hmm. want to attract to us and that we will become geniuses when we have it. Mm -hmm. And we buy into those, those, uh, advertising because it, we are like, Oh, I want to have you all want that. I want to feel the way it feels to be that person mm -hmm. who has that iPad. We buy into that. Well, a study has shown that individuals with autism don't buy into all that bull. That they tend to still, even after shown all these things that depict people as being happier because they're drinking this soda. My iPad just crashed. Um, you know, I'm happier because I'm drinking this soda. Soda. People with autism still stick to the the, the rules, merits of the the product. merits of it. You know, is it better than? Does it taste better than right. this one? They they don't buy into the idea that if I drink this soda, it's going to make me thin and right, popular, right. Uh, which is kind of wonderful and pragmatic and, and fabulous. But what I wonder is, is, because there are so many individuals with autism now, mm -hmm. does that mean that marketing is going to change? I don't know. We'll have to we'll wait have to and see. see. We'll but see. So the study is out, and uh, you can check that out. It's all over the news right now. People is it are really? talking about it. Yeah, it's everywhere. Um, that, because it's a benefit. It's Science a plus. alert. But, it's, where you got the but, but there were 17 different iterations okay. of it okay. that I could have 
uh, grabbed, but I just particularly like okay. this one. In any case. So are we going to take a break? We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to be joined by Dr. Linda Copeland, the unicorn, and she's going to talk with us specifically about sleep. Sleep, a very important topic for a lot of us. A lot of us have kiddos that have yeah. had sleep issues and have sleep issues. I was saying earlier that you can put together the perfect program. You can have the perfect diet. You can have the best ABA team. You can have the best teacher and the best IEP, but if you're not getting sleep and your child isn't getting mm -hmm. sleep, you're not going to make the progress that you hope to make. That sleep is really, you know, the first order of business, right. making sure that you as a parent, I would, right. you know, I was told, and I was share this now with people, you got to put the ox oxygen mask on yourself first, that until I got some sleep, I wasn't going to be able to do an intervention with my son. Right, right. Boy, Sleep and is I'm, a big deal. I'm sleep deprived today and I can feel it. Yeah. Yeah. It's not it's not a fun way to no. feel. And I think I don't know how if you feel this way, but I think that when we were younger we had a bank of of non sleep hours yeah. that we could use up. And I used all of mine in college. <laughs> and then, and then I had a child with autism and I used any like anything that was left. I don't I can't go without sleep now. Yeah, I can't either. I don't I function can't well. Do it. All. Yeah. No, no, no. Used to be able to. Can't do it anymore. Right, so we'll be back with that. Anyway, we'll back with yes, back with Dr. Linda Copeland. Stick with us. Hello, fellow activists. Let's talk about step six. Live in gratitude and give back. Have you ever noticed that it's impossible to feel sorry for yourself when you focus on your blessings? I have an exercise for you. Take out five pennies. I want each penny to represent something you're thankful for today. Now I bet not one of those pennies represented something material, but that every one of them represented someone you love or a moment you shared with that someone. Go through life, hearts still empty, standing knee deep. There's a song by Kathy Matea called Standing Knee Deep in a River and Dying of Thirst. Sometimes we need to look at the river of blessings flowing underneath us, and then we see we're not so thirsty after all. Once you realize how fortunate you are, you can freely give back to others. And there's nothing that will make you feel more fortunate than giving to those less fortunate than you. So start your day with an attitude of gratitude. And until next time, keep the faith. Hi guys, welcome back. For the month of July, I figured we're gonna do something again that's more for outdoorsiness since it's summertime and I know your kids are gonna be home and you need some activities to do inside and outside. So for July, I figured we'd make a lantern. So let's get started. The materials you'll be needing are wax paper, an iron, crayon, scissors, popsicle sticks, pencil sharpener, a glue gun, and tape. What I did first is that I have my iron heating on medium heat, okay? Make sure you keep this far away from your child because I won't want them to get hurt. Next thing I want to do is I'm going to take my wax paper and I'm going to make four sheets. I'm going to cut out a thing that's about 12 inches long, okay? Now that I have my wax papers cut out, what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab my crayon and if you have kids around, which I hope you do, I'm going to grab them and have them make some crayon shavings. What the shavings you're going to end up doing is making it a design. And again, this is another time for you and your child to talk about colors. You can discuss like what would happen if you mixed, you know, some blue crayons and some yellow crayons. What would that produce? When you and your child have finally decided there's enough crayon shavings on your wax paper, what you're going to do next is you're going to take it and fold it in half. Now that I have it folded in half, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take an old newspaper and then I'm going to sandwich it in between. And then with my iron on medium heat, I'm just going to have it gently on there just so the wax melts into the paper and becomes one thing. Let's take a peek inside. And as you can see, all the crayons have you know, melted into it, making this beautiful kind of like rainbow-ish color. All right, now I'm gonna do this with the other three that I've made, and then we're gonna assemble our beautiful lantern, all right? So here are my four finished panels that I'm now I'm ready to build into the lantern. 
So what I'm going to do is I have these popsicle sticks and I'm going to build them into a square and glue them together with my hot glue gun. While you're building your lantern, it's a good opportunity to work on math skills with your child. You could discuss how many sides does a square have versus how many sides does a cube have. Okay, I'm going to do this another three more times so I have one for every single side. All right, well, now that I have these four different sides built, I am now going to take these wax paper things that I built and then I'm gonna put glue on here and smash it on there, okay? I know the wax paper is way too big for it, but what we're gonna do later is trim it. All right, so now they're all done being glued together. Now I'm gonna take my scissors and trim along the outside. Now that the four sides are done, I'm gonna take some tape and I'm gonna line the edge of it so they will stay together to make my cube form. And voila, here's my lantern, but it's missing something. You're right, it's missing a light to illuminate it. So what I'm gonna put in here is an LED light. I'm definitely not gonna put a real candle or else this thing's gonna catch on fire and that is a real safety hazard, okay? So, here's my little guy and I'm gonna turn it on and let's see what happens. Ooh, look at that. Isn't that pretty nice? And it's not even dark yet. I would love if you shared your pictures of your finished crafts, but until then, craft on. Bye guys. Can you see me flying by your side? And welcome back to Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. As promised, now we have our special guest. Dr. Linda Copeland is joining us via Skype, and you're going to see it's a little bit interesting because we're having an issue with Skype this morning. So we've got her live on the phone and live on Skype. And we apologize, it's gonna be a little bit interesting. It's not gonna sync up just right, but it's good information. And we welcome Dr. Copeland back to the show. As I mentioned, we call her lovingly the unicorn because she is both a developmental pediatrician and a board certified behavior analyst. And that, my friends, is rare um, and amazing. So, uh, and she's pretty fabulous and sparkly, so we like to call her the unicorn. And we haven't had her on the show for a while, but Dr. Copeland, thank Thank you for being willing to be on the show today. Oh, my pleasure. And and thank you for being willing to be on the phone with us. So, Dr. Copeland, we particularly today wanted to talk with you about sleep, and this is something that you're working very closely on right now. Tell our viewers how you're working on sleep. Yes, CARD is working on sleep because we know good sleep is so important for all the children to make good progress in their learning. We also know that kids with autism tend to have sleep problems frequently. There's been some good behavioral research on behavioral treatments for young kids uh, under the age of 12. So we're doing a study for kids who are called clients between the ages of two and 12 who've had six months or more of significant sleep issues. The uh, ABA team with the BCBA supervisor trains the parents on how to implement the behavioral sleep treatment. And we've already started this study. There's going to be both an experimental and in a control group all the control kids will later be offered the same behavioral sleep treatment. And we are just looking for more kids. Okay. So, and, and I have to say too, you're doing an excellent job. I, you know, there's a little bit of an echo and, and I don't know if you've ever had to do that where there's a little, you can hear yourself and there's a little bit of an echo. It's really an exercise in concentration and Dr. Copeland's doing, <laughs> br doing brilliantly. I had a good night's sleep last night. There you go. And that's, that's why you're doing so good. But so for Dr. Copeland, is it only CARD families that are participating in this study? Uh, yes, at this point. This okay. is mainly for CARD families. We will, CARD will share the information with any family that's interested. But as far as conducting the study, being a subject in the study, yes, okay. only CARD families. So if you are a CARD uh, parent and you want to participate in the study, what do you need to do to get involved? And what will you be doing once you are involved? Uh, okay. Uh, first, uh, to be eligible, the child has to be between the ages of 2 and 12. Uh, they can't have any seizures or be on seizures. 
your medication because we know that affects sleep. Uh, and so you have to be in general good health. And their sleep problem has had to be going on for more than six months. Also, it's okay if they take melatonin, but uh, to be in the study, they can't be on any other prescribed like sleep medication. Okay, and part of that all, so that people understand, is that you're trying to isolate and see if behaviorally you can shape and change sleep habits and have it work better. Is that a pretty safe assumption? Yes. Okay. So, and not to say that they won't, the card won't ever look at individuals who have epilepsy or that, you know, there are kids who have sleep issues in card that are being treated for that. It's just not a part of the study because they're isolating that. Uh, exactly. So, um, with your help, we made two training videos. Yes. One for parents, one for the behavior analysts at CARD on the behavioral sleep treatment. We will offer this for any family who's in CARD who has a, a child with a sleep problem. Um, so the, the treatment still can be done. It just wouldn't be done within the context of the study. So if families are interested, they should tell their ABA supervisor, and that supervisor can get in touch with me or Dr. Emily Jean, G-E-A-N, uh, one of our card therapists in uh, Beaverton, Oregon, because she's uh, co-directing the study with myself and Dr. Dixon. Okay. And now you said your child has to be having a sleep issue that's been going on for six months or more. What kinds of things do you constitute a sleep issue? Uh, one would be when the family tries to send the child to bed, they resist going to bed. They may have what are called curtain calls, where they're frequently up out of bed after you kiss them goodnight, so they have difficulty falling asleep. It could also involve children who then wake a lot in the middle of the night. Those kind of sleep problems. Okay, great. I love calling it a curtain call. That's <laughs> such a better name than what we want to call it, right? <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen Dr. Copeland or Nancy. There's a there's a wonderful Jennifer Garner video where she reads a bedtime story, and um, it's only for adults. Uh, but she reads the bedtime story, and it says, you know, some, some, something, and then she says, now go the mm to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> and after at the end of every line, I think. Oh, but it's I it's on it. it's on YouTube and everybody can yeah. check it out. It's not something to share with your children, but it's a good laugh for the tired parent. Yeah, I had curtain <laughs> call, I had I had a lot of curtain calls last night because we just got back from the East Coast and spent an entire day flying, and we were up at five a.m. East Coast time. Oh, so that explains. It. Yeah. So, but I, I'm wondering how long this uh, is going to last with the curtain calls. Well, and now that we've talked about the fact that there's this study, and we've given people the information, let's let's for everybody let's else who's it. like, my goodness, I don't get to be a part of the study. Let's get into it. So, Dr. Copeland, um, that you've been working on sleep for a while. Here's Nancy with her issue with her son getting up. How, how long is this going to last? And is there something Nancy can do to get him on, an, on a, a Pacific Time Coast schedule now? Okay. The behavioral treatment we use has already been researched and published by Dr. Greg Hanley. And it involves good sleep hygiene from sleep medicine plus some behavioral strategies. Uh, so one thing that you can do for the curtain calls is give them, give your son a laminated bedtime pass right. or several passes. And make sure whatever he's using the pass for to come out of bed for two to three minutes, that he has plenty of access to it even before the kiss goodnight or what we call the bid goodnight. But as long as he has a pass, he can trade it in for one trip out or the parent coming in for two to three minutes. After he's used up all his bedtime passes, then you just redirect him back to bed without granting him what he wants. Uh -huh. But as long as he uses the pass, he does get what he wants. That starts to put some control 
over the curtain calls. Okay. Some of the finer points of that are, though, as a parent, you have to be well-rested enough to follow through with that. Exactly. You can't give up. Um, one of the problems I think a lot of parents have with the issue of ch their children that join them in their own bed is they're so exhausted that after a while they yeah. give up. Is that something you see quite a bit? Yes. Yes, that's very, very common. And we get strongly learned associations with how we fall asleep. Sleep is a very natural and powerful reinforcer. So whatever the child learns to associate with falling asleep, they become very dependent on. And then they think they need that to fall asleep. So while the parent temporarily solves the problem by laying down next to their child, they're actually creating more of a problem long term because it's what we call a dysfunctional sleep dependency. And those kinds of sleep dependencies can't necessarily be there all night long. If the child is used to laying next to the parent to fall asleep, it sets the stage for them waking up multiple times in the middle of the night, especially if the parent later goes back into their own bed. Because the same conditions are not there all night long that the child learned to fall asleep with. And so when, you know, sometimes we do this and, and we get to the point where it's already well established and then we find out, oh, that wasn't the way to do it. How do you begin to unravel these associations that are dysfunctional? Right. We have to help them unlearn those dysfunctional sleep dependencies and learn other habits. So in addition to the bedtime pass, there's a nice a little technique called time-based visiting. And you can substitute it instead of the parent laying down next to the child. So after the first bid good night, uh, the parent, the first night of behavioral treatment, revisits the child eight times in 30 minutes. So what, what the child starts to learn is, I don't have to do anything. I just have to lay here and relax, and my parents are always going to come back. And that uh, tends to work as a substitution for the parent actually laying down next to them. And then over time, you, you pair those eight visits down right. little by little? Pretty, pretty quickly, you can start weaning it down. And Dr. Hanley has a precise protocol on how to do that, and that's something we teach the parents how to do in our study. Okay. When you talk about... And in the video. Yes. Okay, so the bedtime pass, we get that concept. When you talk about good sleep hygiene, what else is included in that, Dr. Copeland? We are built to sleep in the dark, and we sleep better in cooler temperature. So you want to make sure that child's not being sent to bed too early. Uh, we also have a biological clock, and we all have a, a, a biological time of peak alertness in the early evening. You don't want to send a child to bed when they're at the height of their peak alertness because that will trigger some sleep-resistant behaviors. So learning to know your child's biological clock and, and picking a, a good bedtime is part of it. And having good room conditions. There shouldn't be a lot of bright light. Little night light's okay, but you don't want any direct lighting right across the eyes. And for that reason, we also recommend stopping any kind of screen time like TV or iPad or computer time about 45 minutes before the desired bedtime. So lots of strategies like that. And we try to get all the strategies done all at once for that particular child's and family's needs. And, and isn't it also that we don't let them sleep so late in the morning? I mean, I, I, I see this with my teenager now that it's summer and all of his friends are sleeping till like 11 or, or noon. Wow. And I mean, that's a teenager thing to do. Right. And we're just not letting him do that because I know if we do, it'll take us forever to get him back on a schedule. So not letting them sleep late in the morning, and that's part of it too, right? Exactly. 
you want to make sure they get enough sleep. And the younger the child, they do tend to need more sleep. So a four-year-old may easily need 11, 12 hours of sleep or a little bit more. Um, and even by the time we're a teenager or adult, on average, we, most of us do better with about nine hours of sleep. But we shouldn't regularly, routinely sleep a lot more than we really need. What's, what's your opinion on the napping? When do we know when to get rid of the nap and, or should we keep the nap? I want a nap now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the older we get, little uh, Bob Hope used to take naps all the time and he credited for living long and having uh, lots of energy. So there's something to be said for naps for adults, but it, it's individual for children. Um, a lot of a preschoolers may outgrow the need for a nap sometime between three and four years of age, and some still need it. Uh, but usually you don't want really prolonged naps, like two hours or more, if they're having trouble staying asleep at night. Well, Jem used to nap like a champion. Really? And man, it was my best time of day because he would nap and I could actually get something done. But then he wouldn't go to sleep until 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, well, that, that's the downside of a yeah. nap. Yeah, right. 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 And when we got rid of the nap, yeah. when we got rid of the nap, he would go to bed earlier. Uh -huh. um, but I can remember for a long time, between the hours of 3.30 and 5, if I didn't have a brass band in the house... I mean, literally, we would get up and dance and do all, because if you let him sit down for a second, he would cork off, and then you'd be up all night long. Oh. So we would have to plan an activity that did not involve being in the car from 3.30 to 5. If you put him in the car, it was lights out. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't right, wake him up for right. anything. Yeah. Um, and occasionally one hour nap for younger kids. And, and some two- and three-year-olds definitely need a two-hour nap. But you don't. You want to avoid frequent and prolonged naps during the day. The older the child gets. Okay. All right. So you had some questions about medication. Yes, I I wanted to know about some natural supplements and some of the more popular sleep aids. I guess we would call them. I know one is of course melatonin, and then there's another yeah. one called Tranquil Sleep that I've used with my son that has melatonin and tryptophan and maybe lysine or something. I don't know what else. I'm not sure what's in that one, but I know... Uh, theanine. Theanine. L-theanine. Sorry about that. Um, so, yeah. Dr. Copeland, what is your opinion on some of these natural sleep aids? Uh, the natural sleep aids are pretty good. They can be helpful. You don't want the child to become totally dependent on them because they tend to develop a tolerance. But we make... Our brain makes melatonin, deep in the centers of our brain, and it's made to regulate our sleep cycle. Uh, so melatonin is good, and uh, it gives a natural uh, type of sleep. There's no other prescription medication, even though it may work to get the child to sleep, that gets a good quality of sleep. That's why it's better for children to treat the sleep difficulties with a behavioral approach instead of prescription sleep aids. Uh, but we do allow melatonin in the study because it does allow a good quality of sleep. Uh, and uh, tryptophan uh, does have a sedating property. Uh, it's related to the production of serotonin and then eventually melatonin. It's amino acid that occurs naturally in food. Uh, so it's an okay supplement too. And then L-theanine, another amino acid, does have calming properties. So those are the three that I think are the best quality. Okay. Well, this is all very fascinating. We go back to if you're a card family really want to, and you're having sleep issues, and if you qualify, if your child's between the ages of 2 and 12 and you're not on any other medication other than uh, the melatonin and you're not having seizures or on seizure medication, then you can qualify for the study. If you don't qualify for the study, you can still have the protocol for it. It is on videotape. We helped Dr. Copeland to videotape the protocol um, for you and for your supervisor. You just won't be included in the study. For our viewers who are not card parents, uh, Dr. Copeland, is there a way that they can view the p protocol? I, I would think so. If the, the videos are on Vimeo, and maybe if they request them through you, Shane,
Shannon. You okay. could give them the website to watch Great. the videos. Is that possible? I can, have, I can make that happen. So if you want to watch those videos, the ones for parents, write to me and I can make that happen. Uh, but I, I really appreciate you being with us today to talk about these things and the importance of it because honestly, if we don't have sleep for the, for the child, then we don't have it for the family and then no one makes the progress that we could be making. I really feel like it's one of the most important gifts that we can give our child is the ability to go to sleep even if we're not there to sleep through the night and we have to give that gift to ourselves or we lose our minds. Is that overstating yeah, it? Yes. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, yes. We've had, I just want to mention this one last thing. We've shown in our skills profile some children who, after they improved their sleep, really picked up their rates of learning and skills with their ABA program. Absolutely. And and I, I don't, I know you're in the middle of a study, so you can't really say, but I, but it, can can I say that these techniques have been shown time and time again to be very effective? Yes, and they have been published in behavioral psychology journals by Dr. Hanley. Dr. Hanley is excited to work with CARD on our study because we're doing an experimental and a control group so we can publish it in medical journals and make more doctors aware of these behavioral techniques which is great. And, and again, I want to say that if you're in the control group, you will eventually be given the behavioral intervention. And a exactly. big, and a big have everybody. Yeah. A big part of this, as we said, though, is that you have to be able to follow through on it. And because you might be listening and going, yeah, well, the bedtime pass, I tried it. Or, you know, we've done the curtain call thing before and it doesn't work. Or, you know, we get to a point where I can't force them to do anything. And it, and it is essential. A lot of times the first night, it's not going to work. Right. The first night it's not, and you, and you have to have a plan to get through that first night and have no sleep so that the child sees, oh, they're not giving in. Um, and right. oh, they're not going to talk to me when my bedtime passes are out. It's a drag the first night. But I, I don't, I mean, I can speak for myself and we've done the bedtime pass thing here on the show for years and even offered the, the format for the laminated thing that people were doing the craft project themselves and doing it. And for us and for most people reported that really it took a maximum of three nights is what I recall before they saw a tremendous difference. And I know that you feel like I can't do without three nights of sleep, but if you could do without three nights of sleep to have it so that the rest of your life and your child's life you slept, you would gleefully trade it, yes, right? Yes, right. So as, am I, is that, like, do you find that too, that most people, that three is a pretty average number for it to work, Dr. Copeland? Right. Um, my parents start to get excited because they start to see some progress by day three. There you go. And the overall behavioral treatment doesn't usually take more than one month's time total to finish the whole program and have established much better sleep habits. Um, there's also some strategies that Dr. Hanley incorporates right from the get-go to even try to make the first night easier. Uh, he has parents record the time the child actually fell asleep the night before you start the behavioral sleep treatment. And say the child didn't fall asleep till 11 p.m. Um, the day you start, or the night you start the behavioral sleep treatment, you put them to bed an hour later, so at midnight, say, in this hypothetical example, because you want to get maximum motivation for sleep. So Dr. Hanley has fine-tuned a lot of strategies to make it as effective as possible. Okay, so if you want that strategy, you want the, the video that Dr. Copeland did about that strategy, from start to finish, because it's a kind of on the long side, it's like an hour, um, write to me, s.penrod at autism-live.com, and I can get you connected with that. But it does work, and, uh, and man, is it worth it. It's so, yeah. Yeah. so very worth it. Anything uh, else? I should mention, for those who are actually in the study, it won't be videotaping every night, but we ship a camera, I had the ABA team bring a, a nighttime recording camera. We film some of the nights uh, to, to get the data that we need for our study. But the ABA team would help the family with that filming. Okay, 
spectacular. Thank you so much for addressing something that I know so many families have difficulties with, Dr. Copeland, and thank you. We, oh, we thank miss you, you. Shannon, and Autism Live for having us. We miss you, and, and we need to work out some time to do this on a more regular basis because we miss you, and, okay. have, and our viewers ask for you all the time and say, when is the unicorn coming back? Uh, so we'll have oh, to find thank time you for so that. Much. All, all right, right thank you, take Dr. Care. Copeland. Thanks okay. a lot. Bye-bye. 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 Uh, that was Dr. Linda Copeland, and she is the unicorn. Yeah. Now, did you did do the token economy with Jim? Uh, we did the bedtime pass, yes. The bedtime pass. Yes, we did. And um, it, 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 we, it worked really quickly because he didn't want to do it. He was older, I think, than the yeah. typical kid. Yeah, so was Wyatt. He was probably, I think when we did the bedtime pass, he was 10 or 11. Right. And he was like, this is a baby thing. I don't want to do it. And right. I said, well, these are the things. Um, and, and, I, and, and we did it, and he saw how it worked, and he was like, I'd rather just stay in bed. Yeah. And then he did. Right. I, uh, I think I might have to reinstitute it because Wyatt came in last night several times. Yeah. Um, and then ended up coming into my bed when I was dead asleep, and I woke up this morning, and he was there. Yeah. So that well, happens from time to time. And, and, you know, the thing about it is we did, on the show, we had a, a format that was a bedtime pass, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we showed you how to laminate it and whatever. It's somewhere on our YouTube channel. But, um, but then when I said to somebody that one of the, I, I said to uh, Angela Persicky that, you know, he, he just didn't want to do it, so he just did what we asked him to do. And she said, you know, there's tons of ways of doing it for older kids. Uh -huh. That, it, you know, uh, she was saying you get a deck of cards. Right. And you take out the four aces and, and you just give them and they say, these are your hall passes. And they go to high school, they, you know, and junior high, they know what hall passes are. These are your hall passes. You have to turn it in to be able to get out of bed and you have to give each one of them. So that, you know, she was like, you can make it suit kids that are older because what you're just t teaching them is boundaries. Right. You know, my boundary is you Pat, You can come in and talk to me four times, mm -hmm. and after that, you don't get to talk to me. Okay. And and that what that sets up is a terrible circumstance. Yeah. Where you're there and ignoring, and they will escalate. Yes. And you have to ignore that, and it's a drag. And I would say for for those of you who are doing that kind of thing, you can't start that intervention until you have yourself rested and that might mean that you have somebody else come and be with him during the afternoon so you get to take a nap and that you have somebody else come and spend the night to say no you know mom's not available right, right now right like and and that's the length that you have to go to sometimes you got to call in backups mm -hmm. um but when we're and and samantha's telling me we got to go because we got to call out alex plank but when you follow through with the intervention, and mm -hmm. sometimes it takes Herculean effort, right. it works. Right. And that's what we have to get to sometimes is first the mindset of, okay, what's it going to take? How do I put that in place? How do I get the support that I need? Because otherwise... Um, it's like everything else. If you, you know, I, I can tell you every diet that didn't work, right? Because I didn't do it, right? Right. right. Um, but this works with our kids. But sometimes you got to have support. So, right. in any case, uh, do we want to just get Alex on the phone, or do you want to go to a break? We're going to okay. go to a break. So we'll be right back. Hopefully, keep your fingers crossed for the Skype gods that we'll be able to talk to <laughs> okay. Alex Plank at the Autism Society of America. Stick with us. Um, being part of this community is really important to a mom um, with a son like Jackson because it really does take a village and you need so much support, you know, to, um, to help bring out all of the amazing qualities and um, skills and talents that our children have. So I'm, I'm just very grateful to everybody who was a part of this.
I think it helps with all sorts of that uh, self-esteem, social skills. They seem to communicate a little bit with each other and they had a lot of friends. Um, the helpers were phenomenal and I think the social skills for sure because they, you know, they worked together and they did a couple of group things across the floor and they sang songs together and I, I yeah, for sure, I think it's a really huge deal. A great program. What programs like this show is the person is in front of what we call today a disorder. I think what we're finding is that uh, these sorts of brain challenges that make people unique can actually be gifts in, in ways we haven't discovered in the rest of society to, to bring them out. So when you see a program like this and you see the kids dancing, having fun, and making up jokes, making up the story, I was here when they did that. That was so amazing to watch because they were all focused, they were all present, and they were all laughing, they were all getting into the creation of this story. And um, that to me sort of broke the barrier to say, now well, first we're dealing with people and, and then we're dealing with the challenges. Adults don't really believe kids. They think, ah, oh, kids are kids. What are they talking about? But when a child stands up for what they believe in, it's so strong and powerful. I first got involved with autism advocacy four years ago when my friend was diagnosed. When I found out about my friend's diagnosis, I didn't really understand what it meant. to me or change our friendship. I didn't look at her any differently. We still had so much fun together. Now I know that she experiences life a little differently than me, and that's okay. Knowing what she goes through has helped me to understand and be more caring towards other people in similar situations. I got involved with ACT Today because I wanted to do whatever I could to help. They provide options like behavioral therapy, medical care, social skills programs, assistance to military families, and much more. Being there for my friend was my number one priority. I've been volunteering and spreading the word about the cause via my social media platform because raising awareness is a crucial first step. There needs to be more kids and teens involved to make sure that our voices are heard just as loudly as the adults. You may be small like me, but your acts of kindness are not. Welcome back. We are hoping that the Hello. Skype holds long enough, but we're, we're going Hi right there. now to Alex Plank live from the Autism Society of America conference. And we, huh? just, and we just lost him. We had him, we lost him. We're going to try to get him back on the line. He was there with Anita Lesko. Tell us about Anita. Anita is amazing. If you, you guys probably all know her as being one half of the autism marriage that happened at the Autism oh, and Love yes. Conference that she married the love of her life 
uh, at the Autism and Love Conference. And Anita is this amazing woman that she's a, uh, an anesthetologist. Uh -huh. an anesthetologist. Anesthesiologist? That's the word I'm looking Anesthe for. Oh, here we've got Alex back. Alex, you there? I accidentally connected to the Wi-Fi and it disconnected me. Oh, interesting. But we're live now, Alex. So we're gonna um, we're gonna, we're introducing Alex Plank. He's on the floor of Autism Society of America conference. And I was just saying that you were with Anita. Is she there, Anita Lesko? Yeah, she's right here. Fabulous. So now we've got you. We can see both of you. Yay! I love the hat, Anita. You look fabulous. So how's the conference, you guys? It's great. We've we've been at the pre-conference. We're at this autistic. What is this called that we're doing right yeah, now? People on the spectrum of autism panel. And yeah. So the people on the spectrum of autism panel. And who's on the panel today? Anita is. Now tomorrow I'm on the opening keynote panel. Um, that's a different thing than this thing. And what is the panel yeah. discussion centered on? What is your dis panel about? Tomorrow. Yeah. The panel is about uh, quality of life. What, what quantitates a good quality of life as a person on the autism spectrum, how to get there, um, thing, issues to deal with parents and how you feel about parents and, and their quality of life, having somebody who's on the spectrum. Uh, Connor is on the panel, uh, myself, um, Darius Frazier. Scott Babish's son is on the panel, and I forget who the other folks are. Well, and yeah, I, it sounds like it's going to be great. I would love to see that, and I think, Anita, you're probably one of the best people to be on that panel to talk about quality of life, because as far as I can see, you know, look, you've got love, you've got love of, of your husband, and you've also got a great job, and you're successful at your job, and mm -hmm. you've got friends. I, I, you know, how do you define quality of life? I define good, best quality of life of being able to be independent, live independently, have a, a husband, you know, marriage, um, a career, and also being a full-time autism advocate also is a very highly important to me. That's a to me great quality of life to have all those things. And but it comes down to at the end of the day, the feeling of peace, comfort, and security with my husband, home, and quiet time, just relax together and feel like, you know, I have somebody who's there for me all the time. That's that's a very important I got, I got issue. Well, well and, and amazing, I'm sure it wasn't easy um, for you to be able to get that. We, we've only got a couple of minutes, but we're hoping that we're going to be able to Skype with you again tomorrow, Alex. I'm just wondering, as this conference starts, what's the single thing that you're looking forward to the most, each of you? Well, other than Anita's panel, I'm really looking forward to uh, John Elder Robeson. He's giving a talk on Friday. He's doing some book signing stuff on, on uh, Friday as well. It's going to be fantastic. And, uh, you know, I'm very good friends with John, so we'll be hanging out here. Um, another cool thing is that the Asset Conference was great. Anita did a great job there, too. Um, we're about to have a meeting for the, you know, to go over how that went. Uh, so that, that's been cool. What is John Elder Robeson uh, addressing? Um, he's addressing the whole conference. You know, he's going to be on the main stage giving the keynote, um, talking about his story. And uh, I think, you know, as, as you know, John is uh, not always predictable. So we'll see what he talks about. <laughs> and Anita, what are you looking forward to the most? Um, just seeing all the different presentations. I'm also on uh, doing three other presentations besides tomorrow morning's uh, opening keynote thing. I'm on a fun panel tomorrow afternoon with Carrie Magro, Lindsay Nebaker, and Amy Gravino with Stephen Shore as the moderator talking wow. about love, uh, relationships, and marriage. That's going to be pretty exciting. Um, I'm doing a presentation on Friday about what every parent needs to know before their autistic child gets anesthesia. Oh, that's man, amazing. I want to be there for that. Yeah, that's a very then, um, important one. Friday, uh, Saturday's uh, last presentation is about um, when your autistic child, whether it's a teenager or adult, is afraid to get behind the wheel to learn to drive. Wow. I want to be there for all of those, Anita. That's amazing. Um, and, that, and that's just a sampling of some of the things that are happening. Now, if people are in Milwaukee, they can still get there. The conference is, is just starting. Um, yeah, this is the pre-conference, so technically it doesn't start till tomorrow. Yeah, I was amazed to see how many people were getting on planes last night and this morning to get there. 
Um, Do you have information on the conference? Yeah, we saw Elaine Hall. Um, she's been hanging out with us. We went out to barbecue last night with the, with 24, 25 people, 26 people. Amazing. So, well, yeah. I'm really missing being there with all of you. I hope next year that I can uh, make it back to the conference uh, again. But um, cool. how can people get in touch with the conference and how can they find out more? So if you go to uh, Autism Society's homepage, which uh, is autism-society.org, it has all the information about the conference that you can connect with it. And Alex, are we going to be able to Skype with you again during tomorrow's show? Uh, what's that? Are we going to be able to Skype with you again tomorrow? Oh, yeah. Skype back. I'll, I'll, I'll report live with John Robeson, John Elder. He's okay. going to be here. We would love that. All right. Well, you guys have a great time. Give our love to everybody and learn lots to the, so that you can share it with us. Okay. <laughs> you with the flashlight. Uh, I absolutely love you, Alex. All, All right. right. And Anita, right. we got to get you on the show proper sometime yeah. soon when you're not right, super we'll, busy. We will do that. All right. Matt okay. Bye bye, you guys. Too, have a good time. Matt, so. Yeah. Thank right. you, guys. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Yeah, I'll go introduce you. All right. Bye. Bye bye. Um, Boy, I you know it's one of those things where I made the tough decision. Um, I went last year. Yes, I remember for the you went first last time, year. and it was really eye opening. I love the conference, and I you know it was one of those things. Push come to shove this year, there were so many things that I wanted to be able to do, and I couldn't do this. Right. And be here to celebrate my fifteenth wedding anniversary with my husband. Oh, which I and really need and when to is celebrate. that day? That is Saturday. Okay. And then on Sunday, my son and I are leaving, uh, going on a tour of all of the Southwest states. Um, that CARD has offices and, and going and speaking at a lot of offices. We're going to be in Santa Fe, New Mexico. We're going to be in Dallas. We're going to be in Austin. We're in Corpus Christi. We're in San Antonio. So you and Jim are doing this together? Yes. And what are you speaking about? Um, I'm doing two separate talks, one with therapists talking about the parent perspective and and helping them to understand how important the work is and, right. and to know what it's like on our side when okay. they're doing therapy right. because some of it's hard right and i want to make that um relationship a better stronger right. relationship and um and then i do a, a talk with the parents uh card parents about my 10 tips for getting the most out of car right. and having to deal with how, you know, it can be a really rough um, thing. And there are a couple of places where we're doing talks that aren't for card parents. And it's just about the value of good ABA right. and how you get yourself through it. Um, so I was, I was going through the, we were in, we're in San Antonio, then we're in Phoenix, Chandler and Scottsdale, yeah. Arizona. A it's lot be, of that's cities. a lot of traveling. Two, You're have a good trip. two weeks.